All right, Dr. Philippe is from Burkina Faso with the Assemblies of God. Welcome. Thank you. Bonjour, Philippe. Bonjour, comment ça va, Marc? <laughs> ça va très bien, merci. Et vous? <laughs> très bien. Quelle heure est-il? Quelle heure est-il? Uh, il doit être 13 heures moins quelque chose, 12h54. Oh, wow, well, pretty close to us. Je serai à Londres début septembre, peut-être, on va se voir. Ah. Je serai à Guildford pour quelques jours. Ah, wonderful. Mm. What does your name mean? Um, Stellion. Horse. Oh, oh, wow. That's, that's a Philippe. great name. I've like... never asked you that question, Dr. Philippe. That's, that's great. <laughs> it's a gift to you. <laughs> what a great okay, name. Um, like you are like Philip, Jordan, Philip means in the Greek as well. Love, love of horses. Yeah. Please put the country that you are from in the chat. Uh, say hello in the chat. <clears throat> We'd like to get an idea of where you are coming in from. Um, and and that will uh, be be good for us to uh, to see. I saw um, James Kamau is there from Tanzania. Um, uh, Ruth and uh, Dave Graf I know are from the U.S. Rogers Fovo is from Tanzania as well. But yeah, please say hello in the um, chat and tell us where you are are coming from. Thanks, Chris, for that. Yeah, James Kamau, I'm from Tanzania. I'm in Dar es Salaam. I'm glad to be in the, yeah, in the event. Good. And you actually are from um, Kenya, but you are you have been serving in Tanzania for some time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And my name means silent warrior. Wow. Yeah. Mark, I should hang out with you more often. I'm learning things about people that I've known for years that I oh. never even thought. <laughs> Silent warrior. And Sounds like a ninja, doesn't it? You sound very dangerous. <laughs> Sounds like you're an assassin, a sicario who appears and takes people out without making a noise. Yes. <laughs> Actually, and he is a, a silent warrior for, well, he's not a silent warrior for God, but he's definitely a warrior for God. So, and great. I see somebody from Brazil. Welcome. Mark, do you know Portuguese? Bom dia. Oh, there you go. That's about it. Obrigado. <laughs> Chris, Chris knows some Portuguese. He's um, spent some time there. Okay. Good. Good. Well, I know that uh, people needed to register, and that's often an extra step we don't think about until we try to get on. Um, so we'll we'll give uh, we'll start on time, but we'll still give people a few minutes here to to get on. Anybody else? Rogers Fovo, you're also from uh, Tanzania. What does your name mean? Uh, my name Rogers. I had to, to follow through the literature. And uh, I think it, it has an origin oh. in France. Hmm. And uh, it is a name which ushers people to start fighting. Oh, you say, oh. Roger, they start fighting. Oh. Oh, but Fovo, Fovo is a is a, a Kisamba Wasamba tribe, Wasamba tribe in Tanga from Tanga region, mm. and the Fovo is that weed which is in the farm. Oh, the weed which it's... is in the farm. Okay. So it is associated with farmers. It seems maybe the the one from whom we take the name was born when women were going to the farm to mm. farm so they 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 they, they gave him that name mm. yeah okay. good all right well um you know we live into our names to some degree but not fully and um uh, in some ways that's probably good um and uh but it is it, it is interesting to hear please again if you as you are coming in please let us know where you are coming in from and uh even the organization that you're with, it would be good to, to see and to, to know that. Um, Pastor Clement is coming in from Chad right now. I don't know all the people that are on. Grace is there from Uganda. Good. 
Doug Gary Weibinga. I am with Network 20 International coming from Grand Rapids, Michigan. All right. I uh, hear Grand Rapids and uh, here as well. So welcome, Gary. <laughs> Great. Mike Dragon, I don't recognize your name, but I could be, I'm, I'm known to be forgetful. So help us uh, know who you are and where you're coming from. Yes, Ruth with Nigeria. I am. Good afternoon, Renita. Is that uh, Bodhi? Yes, I'm the one. <laughs> okay. Bodhi from Nigeria, I recognize your voice. Welcome. Mike ah, Dragon, go ahead. That was interesting. Good to see you again. You too. Uh, I, I work with One Mission Society and I'm focused on the Asia Pacific region. Okay, wonderful. For a church <laughs> vacation. Welcome. And Ruth, you're working with uh, Nigeria. Um, are, you, are you in Nigeria right now? No, I'm in Grand Rapids right now. Okay, good. Welcome. Eric Slabert is coming in. He's with the BAM Global for Southern Africa. And um, yeah, it looks like um, we are continuing to get people in, uh, but I do also want to um, respect everyone's time. This is always the challenge, right? When we um, uh, want to make sure everybody's in the room, but we also don't want to to delay and lose time. We also don't want to make people wait who are on time as well. Um, but we are, let me get started here. I've, I've started the recording already. Just a reminder, if you can continue to um, uh, put your name and the country you're from, the organization you're with in the chat, that will be uh, good for, for Mark to see, for me as well, um, to know each other a little bit and um, uh, uh, as we as we begin our time together. Uh, I'm going to open us with a word of prayer and then I'll do some introductions and um, and then we will we will get to our discussion. So Father, thank you so much. What a gift to be able to have a discussion across so many countries um, at one time. And Father, this is a result of the creativity of your people who are made in your image who have been created to be problem solvers, Father, to, to help this, this uh, creation, your people to flourish. Father, we give you thanks this day that you have made us differently, uniquely. You have gifted us and empowered us, Father, to be uh, part of the participation of your church in every place and in every space. Father, we thank you for each person who is joining and and those who are seeking yet to join in the countries that they are coming from, the context that they are coming from, the organizations that they are coming from. Father, all with a burden to serve you, a desire to see you high and lifted up in every place, Father, for your church to be the bride that you designed it to be and to uh, for us to be ambassadors of who you are. Father, thank you for Mark and for his journey and how you have led him and how you have guided him and how he has been willing to be led by you. Father, to, to speak a message, a message of truth, of a forgotten truth, of the understanding of whole life discipleship. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask that you bless it, that you be with us in it, Father, that we may uh, continue to be inspired and encouraged by each other and that we may carry this message forward um, in our own ways with the competence and the courage and the compassion, Father, to be able to, to make a difference for you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, welcome Amen. to everyone. Um, we are, are so grateful for uh, this opportunity. And uh, just to give you a little bit of the context of what we are doing. Um, when I say welcome, I am saying welcome on behalf of, um, uh, of a couple of different groups. Um, uh, I am kind of been the, assigned to be the mouthpiece for uh, Chris Lake and um, Phil Walker, um, as we've been journeying together with um, the BAM Global um, uh, work that we've been involved in in this last year. BAM Global has been, um, Dr. Philippe was part of that as well, and others uh, writing a paper on the role of the business as mission movement in the church. Um, for the most part, we've seen the business as mission movement growing and expanding and exploding, and it's been very exciting. 
Um, but it's run parallel to the church and it has not intersected with the church uh, like we think it could uh, for the opportunity of, of greater expansion and depth of discipleship. Uh, so that's one hat that we are wearing for, for BAM Global. Uh, the other hat that we are wearing is for the Global Alliance for Church Multiplication. Uh, the Global Alliance for Church Multiplication is a network of, um, of many different church planting organizations and those organizations who help church planters um, have different programs, resources to help uh, us plant healthy churches and holistic churches. Um, we are leading up to the uh, Global Alliance for Church Multiplication Forum, which is October 2 through 4 in Minneapolis. And marketplace engagement is one of the things that we will be addressing, uh, one of the workshop tracks that we will be uh, talking about. And, uh, and yet we find that there can be some confusion about the marketplace, that the marketplace is seen as a place where um, church planters can, can earn money so that they can do the real ministry of church planting. And we want to be able to say the marketplace is a much richer uh, in terms of discipleship and, and carrying out the mission of God and, and uh, as the church is, is scattered. So that's the context. Um, the church that we, the, the paper that we've been writing on the role, the challenge of BAM in the church has talked about theological challenges. Uh, we've looked at um, structural challenges in the church, um, and it was last month that we looked at the structural challenges. Uh, today, we wanted to look at some of the theological challenges, and after the theological challenges, we are going to be uh, looking next month um, in August. Let me just check, get the date here. August 11 is our next one, and we will be looking at the cultural challenges, understanding that there are many different challenges for why uh, work and faith has not stayed tightly integrated um, in church history. There has been times where we have been uh, integrated and then there has been times where we have separated again and then we've come back together to recognize the role of faith and work and then separated again. And one of our beliefs is that uh, this needs to be woven into the fabric of the DNA of the church to, to understand as Mark will tell us a little bit more about uh, whole life discipleship. So to that end, today we will talk about some of the theological challenges. Um, and I'm so excited um, to invite, uh, to welcome Mark Green. Um, Chris Lake was our connection with LICC. Actually for us, we started learning about the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity about a year ago after the BAM Global um, workshop. And um, I've just been amazed by uh, the depth of um, resources and, and information and knowledge and, and desire on their part to see the church equipped um, and uh, for, for every space, every workplace. So I just want to say, I'm just going to read this um, because it's, uh, it's better put than, than I would say for myself. But the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity has a dream that every Christian we go out into their bit of God's world, confident that God can work through them, confident that Jesus is good news for the people they meet, good news for the things they do, and good news for the organizations they engage in. And of course, they say, opportunities abound. 98% of Christians spend 95% of their waking lives on the front line. And by front line, when you hear uh, Mark talk about this. That's a word they use a lot. In fact, um, this is a great book. This is a Mark Green book, Fruitfulness on the Frontline. We're going through that with our team right now for Discipling Marketplace Leaders. Uh, Frontline, of course, is, is where you're doing your work, where your spheres of influence are, whether it's in the home, whether it's it's in the park with your children, whether it's the, um, the workplace, it's, it's your front line. And so at LIC, they say we are committed to empowering Christians to make a difference for Christ in our Monday to Saturday lives, helping church leaders equip their church communities to do it, and fueling a movement to reach and renew our nation. Mark Green has been the um, executive director uh, for LICC for 20 years and now is called uh, the LICC Mission Champion. Uh, maybe he can tell us a little bit more about that, but I think part of being a champion is that you're available to, to speak to groups like us. Um, I know he's doing a lot of writing. Um, another great book he has here, and you can see all my tabs in it, um, Whole Life Mission for the Whole Church. He's got a number of other books as well. Um, 
And uh, before joining LICC, he was the vice principal of the London School of Theology. And prior to that, spent a decade in advertising in London in New and in New York. Uh, we hear that he does a great imitation on Sean Connery um, uh, that his children actually wish he would not do, but we won't ask you to do that, Mark. Um, but we are, are thrilled that you are with us. Um, you spoke, um, you've spoken in many different places. And um, why don't you uh, just give us a, a brief introduction of yourself and your passion and your, your heart's desire, and uh, then we'll get into some of our questions. So welcome. Oh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, what a what a privilege, a joy really to be with uh, so many fellow travellers, uh, fellow pilgrims on this particular journey. I don't think there are millions of us yet, maybe one day there will be. So it's always particularly special to be with people who are concerned to uh, liberate people, all God's people into all of life. Um, a little bit of my journey, well, I come from a Jewish background, as perhaps you can tell if your screen is good enough. And I became a Christian in my last uh, four weeks at, uh, at college, at university, and then went uh, directly uh, in, into advertising. Um, and I was transferred to New York after about three years. And that was when I started to sort of connect to church. I'd been disciple before that, but, and um, this was a wonderful uh, smallish church by American standards, I suppose, you know, 120 members, not a big church in New York. Um, uh, but they were a disciple making church, not that I knew what that meant. <laughs> I was too young a Christian, I hadn't grown up in, in that world. And I was discipled by a guy who was um, associated with a group called the Navigators. And uh, so I just kind of got on with it. And then I suppose in my own history was one day they, they asked me to teach an adult Sunday school uh, on uh, what they used to call marketplace ministry. We call it workplace ministry in the UK. And, um, you know, adult Sunday school had been, in a sense, a great gift to me, because if you become a Christian late, then how are you going to learn if you're only relying, if you're only relying on, on sermons, if you like? So it was a great way to learn. And they asked me to talk about workplace ministry. And quite frankly, I don't think I knew that I was doing it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, I just, you know, went to work and I thought, well, this is obviously where I am. And, you know, who am I going to talk to about Jesus? Well, the people around me and what am I going to pray about? Well, the things that I do. And uh, so they asked me to teach on this. And uh, so I did. And I suppose the thing I learned from it, I, I bought a book. That was the first <laughs> <laughs> was by find out what other people have learned uh -huh. about, um, it, you know, I say it wasn't, it wasn't a big church and we had probably 25 people in in the group I had three adult Sunday school classes operating at the same time and we had a little bit of sharing time at the beginning you know what have you seen at the beginning of each class what do you, what have you seen God doing in the workplace and by the end of the third week uh, I had to sort of cap shorten that sharing time to only 10 minutes mm -hmm. because people had suddenly you know all, God was doing all these things they were seeing all these things and, you know, this was a very diverse group of people. I don't want you to think that this was just a group of young professionals. It, it absolutely wasn't that kind of a church. I mean, there were some because it was a community, but it wasn't like that. And I, I kind of, it was just exhilarating. Mm. Those people who thought they were just sort of turning the wheels and going there were just, God is at work in my life. Mm. And the other thing I learned was, you know, this, what you know, he was in work in all kinds of different places through all kinds of different people. And I never mm. lost that, mm. um, that notion, God can work through anyone. And uh, so that, that was just gripping. Mm. Um, and uh, then I came back to the UK and I, you know, I went to theological college because not to be a, a minister, I've never, sorry, a, a, an ordained minister, I've never, uh, no one in their right mind has ever thought I was called to be pastoral ministry. <laughs> and um, I just to learn more about the word of God. And I suddenly realized no one in my country really was writing about work. There was virtually no new books about it. Um, I think there'd been one, one new book in a decade. It wasn't part of any of the theological college curriculum. They weren't teaching it at conferences, it was just nowhere. Mm. And uh, so for me, that was such a tragedy such a tragedy you know people are going into so much of their life not realizing that 
that it's significant to God, not realizing they can walk with God there, not realizing that it matters to God there. And that kind of felt painful and still does, feels, feels like a bit of an outrage. Mm. And I remember talking to one pastor's wife once, I was doing an, an event with some church leaders in the north of England. And uh, she said to me, she worked in the uh, uh, National Health Service, and she said, uh, you know, some people die without realizing the ministry God has for them. Mm. So I suppose, you know, that's always been inside me, really, that that desire to give every single person, whether they're seven or 17 or 70, uh, um, that they might be part of a community that honors where God has placed them and the giftings that God has put in them, wherever those might be. Mm. So that's that's probably enough about me <laughs> uh, that started you on the journey that you have then been faithful to continue on for for many years uh, i'm struck just by the the heaviness of the words you know it's a it's a tragedy um it's an outrage um and the idea that people die without knowing their calling and uh, that that clearly speaks to the, your passion about this and i i believe it's something for many of us on this call as well, that that, that recognition is growing. And um, we believe that there is a movement afoot um, uh, of, of people beginning to understand this greater uh, call to be, to be um, ambassadors for Christ in every place. So Mark, one of the things that LICC talks about, or, or maybe you talked about it first, and then I, I don't know the whole, you know, LICC was started by John Stott, right? About 40 yeah. years ago. Um, uh, but the the talk is is about whole life discipleship, and uh, many of us on this call are with different mission organizations, or church planting organizations, or Christian organizations. Discipleship is a word that is used um, often. Um, when you say whole life discipleship, what do you mean, and how do you differentiate that from uh, discipleship that? churches often talk about doing or or yeah so tell us a little bit about that uh, well yes um of course you shouldn't really have to use any adjectives in front of discipleship <laughs> right true and uh, the fact that we do um and no doubt at different um, eras in church history people have used different adjectives in front of it because of where the gap might be and i suppose whole life discipleship is what it says it's simply intentionally seeking to learn to learn how to live the way of jesus in every aspect of life and i suppose the differentiation is that i'm, I'm not just learning how to live the way of jesus so i can be a church member or a volunteer in very good social action works or a volunteer in a charity i'm not just learning how to be a good son or daughter or, or father or mother i'm i'm seeking to learn how to live the way of jesus when i go to work when i play football when i watch tv when i go out with friends and how i use my money when i go to school when i clear up the dishes after a meal when i do the housework i'm seeking in a sense to walk with him in all that i do and allow him to work through me be with me nudge me, prompt me, grow me in all that I do. So whole life discipleship can sound like quite a technical thing. Mm -hmm. um, it can sound like what we call in England, uh, I don't know what the equivalent in all your countries would be educationally, but you know, when you graduate high school, as an American would say, um, we get a, something called an A-level. You know, People talk about discipleship as A-level Christianity, as if there's any Christianity without discipleship as if it's for advanced people. Um, and I don't think it is. I think it's uh, God's desire for what well, it's clear. Jesus doesn't say, go make good church members. He says, go make whole life. He says, go make disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are growing people. So, so for me, I think that's, that's the heart of it. And I suppose what happens has happened um, in churches across the world, um, obviously not in all churches across the world, but overall, um, and I can only really speak for the sort of um, 
streams that I know about, which is really the, the sort of evangelical wings of the, of the church. Um, what's happened is that discipleship is basically seen as a thing you do somewhat privately. It's about your relationship with God and about your engagement with the local church. So I'm a good disciple if I volunteer in the local church, uh, if I come to church, if I'm part of the programs, if I give, um, and I'm a good disciple, if perhaps I get involved in a social action project. And those are the things that local churches tend to be most interested in. Mm -hmm. And as you said in your introduction, that that means they're very interested in probably two or three of my evenings and my Sunday and maybe a bit of my Saturday morning, mm -hmm. but not in, if you like, the the other, I don't know, 110 hours that I'm awake during the week. Mm -hmm. Right. And that is not helpful to people uh, because they feel that disconnect. They feel like um, they feel uh, that those other things don't matter because they're not, not of interest. They're not being asked to pray for them or to grow in them or to seek God's wisdom for them. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, they're cut off from the wisdom of the body of Christ, as well as from an imagination around their relationship with Jesus in that place. Right. So the big question mark is how did we get here? So um, as you've said, I mean, what, what our experience with um, Discipling Marketplace Leaders, the ministry that I'm working with, um, we recognize that, um, that, of course, in Genesis 3, there are three things that were lost, right? Our, our relationship to God, our relationship to each other, and our relationship to work and creation. And as you've said, and as we've seen, our uh, churches tend to focus on, on the discipleship aspect of our re restoring our relationship with God, which is incredibly important. Um, but how did we get to the place that we've left off? And, and we do some about our relationship with each other, um, you know, uh, having healthy marriages and, and that type of thing, loving your neighbor to some degree. Um, how did how did we get to this place? What do you think with all the, I know all the studying and thinking that you've done, and um, how did we get to this place that, that you describe this as a tragedy, um, that, that people are dying without understanding um their calling uh and and that that loneliness that then ensues in 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 viewing our our discipleship as our interaction with the local church a couple times a week how did we get here what what's your perception of of um the challenge from a from even a theological perspective then for the church global well um uh, let me just make a, a couple of brief comments about uh, how and then maybe say a little bit more about the you know the impacts of it theologically uh, the how is 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 a, a number of you i'm sure are, are students of this the how is somewhat disputed because actually how things happen is actually quite difficult to reconstruct over time one of the theories uh, relates to uh, christianity moving out of what you might call the hebrew worldview the jewish worldview where everything did matter Mm -hmm. uh, where you know you are tithing mint and rue and mm -hmm. all, every action you've got and if you look at uh, the jewish writings they you know the, the rabbis had and um you know they're, they're thinking about everything they're thinking about how to make love you know they've got a whole tractate in mm -hmm. the mission on, on sexual relations and absolutely everything um is is there and you move to a greek worldview where in a sense matter doesn't matter mm -hmm. and you know, for the philosophers or most of the philosophers, you know, the goal, the good life, if you like, is the life of contemplation, not in a, you know, rather than a life of action. Um, you know, the people who are the citizens in Athens are not the laborers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a true democracy. Yes, the people who had a vote had a vote, but not everyone had a vote. And so um, business in Latin, for example, is the word negotium not leisure and leisure was not simply play leisure was the opportunity to think mm. so what you have is a reduction of the importance of of the body of of matter of the things that people do with their hands of if you like you know the stuff of everyday life and therefore you dignify the life of the mind the life of the spirit over all of those things 
So that's one way of doing it. You know, a simplistic way of putting it is you replace the Hebrew worldview with a Greek worldview. Um, some people blame Augustine and pro-Augustinians say that's absolute rubbish. So mm. um, there are church historians out there. The, the headline of the impact um, is the sacred secular divide. And I would also say that the, the, the other dynamic here is that there are spiritual forces mm -hmm. at play. And I think it is in Satan's interest to not have whole life Christians. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the impact of the sacred secular divide, you know, the belief that some things are really important to God and lots of, other, and lots of things aren't, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a deep, it's actually very, very deep in the church. And I'll, you know, um, just in a moment say a little bit more of that. Very deep in the church. And it essentially affects almost every single aspect of church life. And one of the things it affects is the view of who God is and what kind of God he is. So, for example, um, I wonder, you know, what kind of father do you want? What kind of father is God? So sometimes I, I think of, of the sacred secular divided father or indeed sometimes the, the father that the church presents as something like this this is a a, a father who um, who loves his teenage daughter and who thinks his teenage daughter is marvelous but he's only interested in her academic results in maths uh, physics and chemistry um, or math physics chemistry and biology because he wants his daughter to be a doctor mm. and nothing else matters the fact that she's a brilliant ballet dancer, the fact that she loves unicorns, the fact that she loves uh, banana ice cream or whatever it might be, or the fact that she's um, a fan of Taylor Swift and that she loves this television program and hates that one and <laughs> thinks boys are stupid or thinks boys or whatever that she thinks at that point, he's not really interested. Mm. And so this view of, a, of God the Father as a God who's only interested in certain things, he actually created in a mother's womb, but all of those gifts and talents that he, no, 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 no. What I'm really interested in, yeah, I'm really interested in relationship with you, but at particular times. And of course, yeah, that's a heresy. It's a terrible reduction of who God is. Mm. And of, you know, his purposes for humankind in the beginning and in the end, and indeed now. Mm. And what it does, um, the sacred secular divide, is it, is it, diminishes our pneumatology, that is our understanding of when the spirit works, where the spirit works, how the spirit works, and what things the spirit might actually be interested in. So if you are someone who believes in the spiritual gifts, you may well be somebody who is not asking God for a nudge about what to do about your uh, business plan. You're not saying as one guy I know who who sells toys. Um, Lord, show me whether I should be selling this toy or not mm. by your spirit, because I can't figure it out with my mind. So show me how by your spirit how to do it. You're not doing that because it doesn't occur to you. Mm. You're not asking for a miracle. You know, one man I know walks into work one day, he works in IT. Somebody comes in on crutches and says, oh, I'm so, I, I did my leg and it's such a pity. I got to play football. I'm the strike and we've got a big match on Thursday and I'm obviously out. He just says, well, can I pray for you? And the guy says, yes. Shall we pray now? Where do they pray? They, they pray in the men's, in the men's, you know, the men's lose right then and there at the, at the office. You don't think that if you're sacred, secular divided. If you're sacred, secular divided, you can't think of an eschatology where there is really a renewed this earth and a renewed heaven. No, this earth is, it's over. It gets completely annihilated, pulverized. If you're sacred, secular divided, and, and I've seen this, um, you know, um, in in movements around the world. So, you have a you have a reduced doctrine of election. So there was a famous um, um, moment, really, in, after the Second World War, uh, when the, the German Church had a really, really big lay movement. I mean, as in a big, I mean, two hundred thousand people turning up at a conference is is about. 199,950 more than we get. So, so mm. big <laughs> conferences and they had big, big movements in, in, in Holland as well. Anyway, this, this group of people in the German church are trying to work out humbly before the Lord and repentantly before the Lord. How was it 
that the German church, the Germany, 99% Christian, somehow allowed Hitler to take to take over. And of course, there's lots of forces involved in that. And they concluded, I'm not saying they're right, but the, the conclusion they came to was that the, the church had not preached a robust enough doctrine of election. Mm. And when I heard that, I was completely bewildered by this. I mean, what do you mean? And then I realized that what I'd been taught about election was almost entirely to do with uh, predestination, double predestination, who's in, who's out, and how many, and mm. whether Calvin was right or Arminius was right, and all this kind of stuff. Very good to think things to think about at theological college, but no one actually said the doctrine of election is about what that we are chosen as a kingdom of priests in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you know that you are meant to be a kingdom of priests in the world, to represent God in the world, then, well, if that's what you've been chosen for, not who is chosen, but what have you been chosen for, then it completely changes how you live in the world. <coughs> and it's the same with ecclesiology. So the sacred secular divide says the gathered church is, is, is much, 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 much more important than the, than the, than the scattered church. And it reduces mission and, and awfully it reduces the gospel because it says the gospel is only about one bit of life. And there's a famous quote that uh, I came across when I was asked to, to speak about a woman called Dorothy Sayers, who's a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's one of the great uh, British apologists, very fine writer of detective fiction as well, but apologists. And she wrote, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, with, with this essay. It's, a book, it's an essay on work written in, 1940, which you can find on the web, Dorothy Sayers on, on work. Um, and it was then published in Letters to a Diminished Church. Right. Letters to a Diminished Church. And in it, she says something that uh, you'll be familiar with, which is basically that the church is, you know, is, is essentially completely lost the plot in relation to its view of the secular, what she called the secular vocation. Um, you know, we 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 treat it with disdain and then we wonder why the majority of the world's people aren't interested in the gospel and then she has this wonderful wonderful line which goes like this why would anyone be interested in a religion which shows no interest in nine tenths of his life yeah. so the point was not about work the point was what was being preached was a gospel was an was a one tenth gospel hmm. so what the sacred secular divide is is it offers to people a one-tenth gospel and um certainly and again you, you you're all coming from different countries but in my country and i think this applies in the us um, young um, non-christian people are interested in actually interested in whole life they want um a life that is integrated they don't want to be one person on saturday another person on Sunday and another person on Monday. Mm -hmm. They want to have a purpose for their life that that overarches it all. So if we offer them a leisure time, um, a leisure time or a leisure time gospel, um, they're just not interested. They want to be authentic people. So the, the, the theology, if we get, when you have the sacred secular divide, it basically messes up everything. Mm -hmm. pretty much every doctrine and what gospel you are sharing with the world on the whole british people have not heard that gospel mm -hmm. so it's not just i want people to go to work and realize it's significant to god and wouldn't it be joyous mm -hmm. i want people to go to work model the whole life gospel and share the whole life gospel because it's a much more compelling gospel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow that's a lot in there um from uh, predestination to um, a missions uh, uh, frame of reference, the sacred secular divide, the whole gospel. Um, uh, I'm sure that some people listening are, are going, wait a minute, I need to think through that. I need to process that a little bit more. I want to invite um, you to, to put some questions, comments in. We will be interjecting um, our discussion with some of those comments because it's important that we, we try to stay on the same page as we can. Um, one of the questions that that came that was written in the chat, Mark, while you were talking was, 
um, and this is something that we hear often, um, the church scattered is, is critically important. Um, does that diminish the role of the church gathered? Um, you know, what, what would you say to that? Absolutely not. I think it, it does exactly the opposite. It massively increases the role of the church gathered because you can't do this without the body of Christ, not, not effectively over time. You need the body of Christ. And um, the, the other, the fear for pastors, the fear for pastors is if I disciple people to be who are, you know, engaged out there, then they won't have any time to be engaged, and, you know, to, to do the things that do need to be done in the church, to, to run the Sunday school, to turn out the lights, to clean the loose, whatever needs to be done in the church. But the opposite is true. Um, first of all, because what you're doing, usually as a pastor, if you're discipling people for everyday life is they're there anyway. <laughs> it's not that they're spending extra, you just go to work. Well, I might as well go to work as, an, you know, sort of an alive disciple of Christ as one who's not alive. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily impinge on anybody's time. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the first thing. The second thing is that, a ch and, and this we have found, is that churches that tend to say, we value all of your life, have people who value the church because the church values them. Mm. And they are excited to come. They've got more stories to tell. They, um, they are bringing their whole selves to church. And churches that minister to the whole self are more attractive than churches that minister to a bit of you. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think there's any evidence uh, so far in any of the churches that we've worked with that um, encouraging engagement in in God's world beyond the ministries of the gathered church reduces the volunteers available for church life at all. Yeah. Um, I didn't invite you to to share things on PowerPoint. So I just um, I want to just share the LICC um, red dots. I, I'm wondering I just I wonder if that might be helpful for people to see. Um, can I pull that up and, and ask you yeah. to talk about it? Sure. Okay. Um, and this is, is something that I, I think has been very helpful. Um, uh, so forgive us, it's on our, our PowerPoint that we've, that we've uh, wow. uh, so, but yeah, if you can just talk about, you know, so when the church is gathered, of course, and then, and then scattered, talk about what this, what you've been doing with this at LICC. Well, um, when I when I came back um, from um, the United States of America, what I realized was that um, on church in church every Sunday, people were, you know, uh, telling us to go out into the world and share the gospel. You know, you got to go and share the gospel. And uh, we're gathered together on the Sundays, you can see in that left hand graph. And then I thought to myself, I don't need to go anywhere because on mon Monday through Saturday, I am already there. I don't, in a sense, need to go anywhere. I don't have to find a special place to be. I am there. And um, this, as some of you will know, this, this emphasis um, on going is actually quite unhelpful in, in this way. First of all, it's, it's a slight mistranslation of Matthew 28, mm. 19. Because it doesn't say go, it says, as you go, make disciples. So mm -hmm. the assumption is that is you are walking, you are out there. It doesn't mean that we don't go, but it, it it's not the real emphasis. The real emphasis in that sentence in the Greek is the make disciples, make, make people who are relating to Jesus and learning from him and, and teaching them all that you know. So when you when you come to the to the, the slide on on your right scattered on Monday what we're saying to people is look look there you are you're the red dots look look around you look at all the opportunities you naturally have in the places you naturally go to connect to people you don't have to go out and cold call though I'm not saying that's not a good thing to do you don't have to knock on doors I'm not saying that's not a good thing to do and um, yeah, somebody's put in chat, I don't need a place to go, I'm already there. Thank you, Solomon. That's that's, that's <laughs> bingo. I wish I had said it more simply myself. And <laughs> and you can see how those red dots, you move them around a bit, and pretty soon, even a small number of red dots, that's the number of red dots in the UK. 
you know, who go to church once a month or more, that's six, six percent around about that. You actually connect to an awful lot of people, you know, in an average week um, when you when you add them up. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in a workplace, if you go to if you're a, if you're a child in a school, well, it's, it's all your classmates and probably many people in your year. If you're a teacher in the school, well, you know, hundreds of people might see you every day. If 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 you're a delivery person, well, you may not have deep relationships, but you're going to meet a lot of people in a day. If you serve in a shop, you're going to meet a lot of people in a day. You know, it goes on and on and on and on. So I think it's helping to people to see and helping church leaders to see that uh, their pe the first step is to make the most of where people spend most of their time. And then let's think about whether there are other things that we can do as a church community in the places uh, where they don't spend their time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, uh, you know, the world will have it, as you said, you know, Satan doesn't care if we go to church and read our Bible, just don't apply it to our lives. Um, you didn't say that, I'm, I'm just, but but you said something about like that. And the idea here is that we need to say these red dots because the world is going to push us to become gray again. Uh, it's good, you know, our, our, our light will kind of begin to dim if we're not continually being, I think, discipled and, and um encouraged and equipped and empowered by the church when it's gathered um very quickly we could we can just kind of flip the switch when we leave the building and and begin to look like everyone else uh in the environment w would you agree with that well i would never contradict you <laughs> really oh that's good to know. <laughs> well not in public and I, wouldn't, I, I, I do agree with that and i think one of the and that is part of the reason why why um the gather church is so important because we need one another we need good preaching and teaching uh, to remind us we need um the ministry of the sacrament to empower us um to stay red and i think you know around that there is a hermeneutical issue here um and, about the way that the bible is taught um, and importantly, I think one of the things that we see in the New Testament is Paul's uh, extraordinary use of very high language in relation to um, what you might call the ordinary people of God. So they're called saints. Mm. New Testament language about, about the people of God is extraordinary. If you were a slave in, in the Greco-Roman society, somebody called you a saint. They said they called you an ambassador. They called you a son or daughter of the living God. I mean, this, this language is extremely high. It's almost unfathomably rich. It's like almost absurd. I mean, we smile when we say, well, you know, Saint Renita and Saint Chris Lake or something like that. But actually that is, I know some of, some, you know, we are, the language is very high. And I think there's a reason for that. It's about re being reminded who we are in God. Mm -hmm. Paul never calls, calls the church sinners. Mm. Right. He never says, morning sinners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's not how he goes at it they may sin and blooming you know corinthians are doing a good job aren't they but or a bad job but but there's this sense isn't there of yeah. this is who you are and that helps us stay red Rem remember who you are royalty yeah. and so on yeah. so there's a there's it, you know the, the preaching the teaching the way that the people of god are addressed in church who they are the identity that they are assigned in christ is absolutely vital and you know you don't have long but an hour and a half or right minutes or how long you thought yeah 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 good um i want to take you back to the address that you gave um in cape town um for luzon and um, we had sent this link out to people. I'm, I'm hoping that you had a chance to, to watch. It was a, a 10 minute um, address that you gave that was, I thought, very powerful. Um, one of the things that you said is in that, in that address is that the church has been employing an inadequate mission strategy around the world, saying that the essence of that mission strategy has been to recruit the people of God to use some of their leisure time to join the mission activities of church paid workers. Then you went on to say that the result is that 98% of Christians are, who are not employed by a church are not being equipped to live missionally for 95% of their waking lives. And we've discussed some of that already. 
But what I'm wondering is, um, uh, as an alternative, you suggested that the biblical model is to equip the people of God for fruitful mission in all of life. And what I'm wondering is, that was about 12 years ago that you made that address in 2010. Um, have you seen this change and what has your experience been um, uh, through LICC, through um, uh, the global movements that, that you've been um, a part of? Uh, what, what are the, the changes that you're seeing? And, and um, let's start with the, the positive. I, I want to hear the hindrances as well or what, what some of the key hindrances might be. But, but most what, what's the good stuff that you're seeing? What, what are you seeing as people grapple with, with your statement? Um, well, if you ask the binary question, is it better or worse? The answer is, I think, pretty much everywhere it's better. And, you know, here we all are. Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, BAM as a movement has grown, and that is clearly one indicator of a, of a concern for all of life. Um, at the same time, I would say that the gains are modest. Hmm. Um, but if I, if, 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 if what I'm excited about is that I see lots and lots of places at the moment where wisdom that can be deployed um, for this cause is being developed, is being tested, and is being used. Mm -hmm. By which I mean, um, we've done a lot of work in the last 20 years um, on how how do you create a whole life disciple making community? Because yeah. there aren't very many of them. Right. And you know, that means that not many people have taught, been taught how to do it. So how do you do that? So we've worked with lots of pastors now on how do you actually do that, whether you're a Methodist or a Pentecostal, a Presbyterian, a Baptist, Episcopal, whatever, how do you do that in your church culture? And so we've done the field work. And I think I can now say, and I mean, Chris is on the call, um, and uh, he is my witness. I can say that we can point to, certainly in the United Kingdom and and in the Netherlands and in and in the US, I think um, you need to nod at this point, Chris, if that's true. Oh. <laughs> um, churches that have grasped this vision and are finding ways to make whole life disciples in a sustainable way. There are not hundreds of them, but we have them now. You know, next time you come to England, Renita, you know, we can send you to some and talk to the people. Uh, lots of them on the outside don't look very different, but you know, they still preach, they still teach, they still sing songs, they still run programs, but they do it differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's incredibly exciting. I can point to theological colleges, mm. not many, but some, Whole Life Mission for the Whole Church was an attempt to see, look around the world and see if we could find best practice in theological education that sought to make pastors who would be whole life disciple makers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we found quite a number of um, bits of best practice, mm. cumulatively in almost every theological discipline you could imagine. Mm. And two or three colleges that had really got it. Hmm. And two of them were, were in Latin America, actually. Um, and so we've got some learning. So that's really positive. You know, we're no longer saying, here is a dream, but nobody's ever lived it. Hmm. Now we're saying, we had a dream, and we can see some people who are living it. So that's really, really example. And then there is some momentum, I think, um, in the United Kingdom, I'm speaking of the United Kingdom, um, one of the, the the leader of the evangelical alliance which has a, a sort of overview he's got a much bigger overview of the nation than i would he said whole life disciple making is now part of the church conversation in the united kingdom and then wisely he added it now needs to become part of the culture and i think um there's a big movement in the states fit to flourish very i think strong on this on this agenda and uh um, I can't speak really at all, really, for the rest of the world. We we do know some people in Australia, um, again, and in New Zealand. Um, so there's momentum, um, but we have a long way to go. And to your to your earlier point, you know, 
within the marketplace, the workplace movement and the whole life movement, there have been these moments when, you know, it looks like we're going to get to a point of no return and, you know, it's going to stick. Yeah. Um, we don't know whether this time it's going to stick. But what we do know is we got further this time than they did last time. Mm. Thanks to what they did last time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, building on a legacy and continuing yeah. to. So I, I, I have to say I'm um, optimistic. I, I'll give you one ground for optimism. Okay. Um, in 1974, when John Stott um, and Billy Graham and Samuel Escobar and Rene Padilla changed the evangelical understanding of, of mission to include what I would call societal engagement, not just social engagement, societal engagement. Mm. They won that battle. By the year 2000, in the United Kingdom at least, there wasn't hardly an evangelical church that wasn't doing something for the poor mm. and thought that that was the right thing to do. In other words, in my country, in the 1960s, liberals thought about changing society and ministering to the poor and evangelicals preached the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big thing theologically, you know, to 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 win that battle. And so it took 26 years for that to occur. And so it can happen. And that is one part of it. You know, once you believe that people's bodies matter and that poverty matters to God and therefore systems matter to God, you're on the road. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good. No, that's that's and I like to talk more about uh, social. So obviously you're talking about social engagement versus societal engagement, um, social engagement where we're addressing the needs of the poor, societal engagement. Uh, talk about that. Um, I have my assumptions for what you're meaning there, but I'll let you talk. <laughs> well, one of one of the. Um, the, the John saw was very, very influenced by uh, this pair of um, South American uh, theologians. He, he went on a road trip with them. I'm not sure it was on the back of a motorbike, but he went on a road trip and he he saw what they were doing. And Rene Padilla was really a, a great man of God. Um, and Rene's vision was for gospel business, for gospel social action, for gospel education, for God, you know, that, that was where he was going. Um, and what tended to happen in the church globally was that it was reduced to social action it was reduced to social action projects they're all vital and what then happens is that they get organized because that's the way to address lots of those things mm -hmm. they get organized by someone with some power and ability to um, get volunteers so how are we going to reach how are we going to have a food program in the town where you can't just well actually i do know somebody who used to do it out of the the boot of their car but you know it's not it's not the most effective way to go about it mm -hmm. long term do what you can to begin with you know you, you you've got to have a system you've got to have volunteers so what then happens is, is people are you know i want to get get with i want to help the point so pastors brilliantly mobilize people around social action projects that's actually something you can do from the center mm -hmm. you can do that from the center you can organize around that and and I can, I don't mean neg negatively, but I can control that. I can resource that if I'm a, a church leader. But the other thing, which is I've got a hundred people in this church and they're all in different places. How do I empower them? Well, that's actually at one level, not necessarily more difficult to do, but it certainly on the surface looks like it's more difficult to do. Mm -hmm. and it certainly over time takes longer to do. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not in control of that. Um, so I think what you have is one of the church's strengths, which is its ability to organize and it, you know, her ability to draw a number of people together to fulfill uh, some, some, if you like, goal. That's easier to do with social action than it is with societal action. Mm -hmm. If I'm uh, in government in the education department, I can't bring the pastor can't, can't send 40 people into my office. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And of course, you know, social action allows us to have numbers and, and programs and, and measurable impact. Um, when we're equipping 
our members to to be fruitful on their front line. <clears throat> it's maybe not a, giving us the we're praying for transformation. It doesn't give us maybe the numbers that we might be looking for. Um, it's not as as clearly measurable, although I think over over time it is right as we see people um, uh, being disciples and, and living that out and and um, uh, the stories. I know that you have uh, at LICC, you have so many great stories of how people are are doing this. And this actually brings uh, me to, there's two questions that were written in the chat um, relating to this. Um, you know, we love to go very quickly from the, the why to the how. Uh, we want to know, how do you do this? Um, and so one of the questions was, how do we become intentional uh, in, in, in spirit, in mind, and in body uh, to serve. Um, how, do we, how do we do this for people? How do we, we help translate that? And another person wrote the question that um, they hear the words uh, work as worship. Um, what does that mean? I mean, if I'm a carpenter and I'm pounding nails um, next to another guy who's also a carpenter and, and I'm a Christian and, and he's not, and he's doing a better job than me, um, what does that look like? How, how, do, we, how do we teach this? How, what, you know, how do we get practical? Um, well, you know, how long you got? <laughs> Those are two very small questions. Let me um, deal with the, the first one. Um, the first uh, question you're asking is, how do we help people, if you like, live this, this kind of life? Mm -hmm. And I suppose what we, we've done with this is, at one level, try to, um, the very, very basic level, is to convince, seek to convince people th through the word of God that where they are is significant, or where they go already is significant to God, because the, the whole earth is, is his. And therefore, what we ask them to do is to ask God, so, so Lord, is there a particular place where you want me to, if you like, particularly serve you or um, minister in your name? And once people have a sense of what that is, then, then, they, then things change. Oh, of all the places I go in a week, this one is the one where God wants me to, to be different. So I'm going to give you one example of this, because it's quite a, it's in one sample, it's a very simple example. This woman was 93 years old, which is older than anybody on this call, as far as I can see, unless the photographs are actually been photoshopped or came from 50 years ago. And her name was Thelma, and she was in a very small church, 12 people in this church. Mm. Um, in, in a not affluent area of uh, the middle of this country. And she had heard a lot of sermons in her time and she loved the church and she did some things in this church. This church was 12 people. And then the, the, the minister, it's Baptist church, the minister, very talented woman who'd been called there, uh, took them through something we called life on the front line. It's just a resource we have. It's, it's, it's not about that resource. Mm -hmm. And um, when Thelma realized that she had a front line. Mm. She's 93 years old. She's not as quick on her legs as she was when she was 89. Mm. And mm -hmm. she realizes that her front line was the, the convenience store, the shop at the bottom of her road that she got all her, her groceries, her food from. Mm. And she went three or four times a week too. And so suddenly, Whenever she's going to that shop, she's mm -hmm. praying beforehand. She's mm -hmm. not running in and out or hobbling in and out. And when her friends say to her, you know, it's, you know, let us do your shopping, you're going to fall over, you're going to break your hip. She's going, no, rain, shine, sleet, snow, I'm there. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm going. And she's totally exhilarated to be there. That's the point. I, she's excited to be working with God. She's mm -hmm. seen where it is. So she's praying for the people and so on and so forth. And of, obviously, apart from any, any, any benefit to those people, here is an alive disciple because she's just seen her place differently. Mm. It's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the story goes, actually, that is that uh, pretty soon uh, one member of the family or another would carry her, her groceries home for her. Mm. She's now getting the walk back and people are in her home and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Thelma is no longer with us, but... Mm. You know, like the unnamed servant girl in 2 Kings 5, mm -hmm. 
who is just there working for Naaman, a girl, probably not even a teenager, says one word, you know, anyone anywhere can be, God can work through them. So I think that's the first one. There's lots of other things one could say about this. And obviously I'm not trying to sell books, but we've got a lot of material on the website that is free. So do have a look. Um, so that's the first one. And the second one, work or worship, actually is one of the, one of the key um, other elements, which in a way we've only really discovered in the last couple of years, which is what we realized was that um, lots of people who are, you know, in, in churches that teach the Bible know that work is significant because they've heard Colossians 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. So they know they're meant to do it with all their heart. They just don't know why. They don't know why. And they think that work is significant, but on the whole, they don't think their work is significant. Mm. Not, not my work hammering in nails, not my work cleaning the house, not my work coding, not my work sh running, a, running a small business. My work, I mean, God's not terribly interested in. I work in general, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we realized we had to do was to help people see um, why their work was, their particular work was significant and how it fitted in with the mission of God. Mm. So the first step in that is to, for people to recognize that Colossians 3 is based on Colossians 1. Mm. You know, Colossians 3 comes after Colossians 1. <laughs> and that took me about 10 years to realize that. <laughs> you know, it's because Jesus shed his blood so that there would be shalom, peace, wholeness in the whole cosmos, so that all things, not some things, might be reconciled to God, that Paul can with confidence then say, whatever you do. Yeah. So that's our first move. And the second move is to look at the way that God works and see what he's trying to do. Uh, we began in Genesis. And what you see in Genesis, and I'll, I will be brief on this. Don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> in Genesis, a God who brings order out of chaos. So he brings order. So we ask people, how does your work bring order? And then we see a God who provides. How does your God work contribute to provision for you or provision for other people? And then we see a God whose work in the end brings joy. You know, it's joyous. This is good. It looks beautiful. It's fantastic. Mm. Um, and, and then we see a God who does produce beauty. It's, you know, it's, it's not just functional. It's, it's beautiful. Mm. And then it's a God who releases potential. He releases potential in matter. <laughs> and then you ask yourself those questions about any, any job you care to think of. Does my work bring order? Does it generate provision? Can it bring joy? Does it create beauty? And does it release potential? Mm. So let's take the work that in the West, or at least in my country, is least well thought of. And that is housework. Mm. <clears throat> unpaid, unpaid work. Mm. Does housework bring order? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does it generate provision for the people in it? Yes. Does it bring joy? Curiously, it does, because a tidier place is usually nicer than an untidy one. Mm -hmm. Clean clothes are usually more pleasant, more joy bringing than, than smelly ones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does it create beauty? Well, usually when something is well cleaned, it's more beautiful than it was, mm -hmm. <laughs> put it that way. And does it release potential? Well, I'm told that a tidy, you know, if you have a tidy desk, it's easier to get on with things. It's certainly the case that if I knew how to file all my documents in my in my computer, I'd find things more quickly and it'd be easier to get on. I could release more mm. potential. Yes, it does. Mm. So everybody needs a theology of housework. <laughs> if you don't have one, why bother? <laughs> why bother? So I, what we're looking for, and of course it's more complex in some sectors, but how does it contribute um, to your point about social action? One of the one of the impacts of the sacred state. Uh, I'm talking to Bammers here, so Bammers know this. So I'm sorry for saying this, but you know, everybody loves the people who alleviate poverty. Yeah. Nobody celebrates the people who prevent it in the first place. Mm. A friend of mine started a business 20 years ago because he wanted 
one day to have a business with 400 people in it. And you, it's an IT business which um, primarily employs people in in Eastern Europe, which is and, and began in the, in the poorest country in Eastern Europe, which was Moldova. And he, you know, the man, the first man who started it, wanted to create jobs in that in that area. As many many people associated with BAM do. How can we, you know, do good business, create jobs which, you know, contribute to the economy and so on and so forth? And of course, every time he pays somebody, they're not receiving charity. Mm. Mm. And every time he pays somebody, five to ten people are benefiting. I mean, you all know this. Well, today he employs twelve thousand people wow. in white collar jobs. Mm. Well, you try to generate twelve thousand salaries in charitable giving mm. every year. Mm. I mean, it's amazing how God has worked through it. I mean, it's completely beyond his ambition, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. But my but but that's not my point. My point really is 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 to go back to the other thing is that all work, well, good work at least, can be seen to contribute to things that God wants done. And that when people can see how I may not be as good as the carpenter next to me, but if I put the nails in true and square in, in the right place and the joist is well set, I've done something, it's now safe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's safe for the person. They can sleep easy, the roof will stay on. I have made their life better. I've, release the potential for uh, safe safe family relationships or whatever it might be i've enabled somebody to sit on a chair and not worry that it's going to fall over i've created therefore the opportunity for fellowship and, i mean just or, and eating together it just goes on doesn't it even with carpentry right well it sounds i mean what we're doing is 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 releasing the understanding of our purpose. Um, you know, we, we talk about man's search for meaning, right? Um, we all want to have a, a life of meaning. We all want to have an impact. And, and many of us think that the only time we can have an impact is when we're volunteering for the local church or, or you know, especially for an impact for God's kingdom when we're talking about God. But to think about this woman viewing the, the, the grocery store down the street that she stops in at as a, a potential front line um, I mean, that that just really expands your mind to think of housework as, you know, doing everyday common chores that that to, from God's perspective, what are we doing? I, I think that's just got to, um, yeah, just be a, a huge relief, a, a huge invitation, a huge um, uh, mindset change uh, that that allows us to to begin seeing potential in every place. Um, what I want to do is, is in light of our time, um, I have a, another question I'm going to ask, but I want to just let people know who are listening. Uh, you know, we do want some dialogue. So um, we're going to open uh, the opportunities, the floor in a few minutes here to, to let, um, uh, let a few of you speak or ask questions or, or um, uh, give some comments. Um, uh, so be thinking about that. Um, Mark, I mean, obviously you said, how much time do we have? There's a lot of different directions we can go in light of this, this conversation. Uh, something you said earlier though, um, we, I know we have people on this call who are living in what we would describe as, as post-Christian um, places. Uh, we have people in this call that are very much in the throes of a very Christian culture. Um, and then we have some that are, are more pre-Christian, uh, where, where Christianity is is the minority, and um, you know it's it's very it's very challenging. Uh, you said that youth today um, want to to know that church has relevance. It's not a Sunday club that we go to. It's not a, um, a once a week. It's not a you know I don't really need it if it's not contributing to my daily life. Um, how do you see the whole life discipleship movement in light of the fact that you know the world is broken into these very different um, times and places and 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 the the environment for Christianity is is very different. Um, and and maybe the reason I'm asking this is you know for my own agenda is is how do we articulate the the both the opportunity the 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 need. Um, almost regardless or, or whether is it regardless of where where we are in terms of our culture and its relationship to Christianity. I hope that question is clear. Yeah. Um, well, that's that is a difficult, difficult question in a way, because um, clearly, you know, um, God 
I mean, Paul, simply put, writes differently to the Colossians than he does to the Ephesians or the Philippians based on um, based on that, just on their context, you know, use diff uses a lot of power language in it in Ephesians because it's there's a big temple to Artemis there, and it's the biggest biggest temple in the ancient world, and the whole city is drenched in magic. He writes different, uses more colonial language to the Philippians because it's a Roman colony. So I, I wouldn't want to, um, I wouldn't want to dare to sort of offer us you know a one size fits all solution to this i suppose for me um the thing that i'm wrestling with is first of all i've i've come to the conclu conclusion that jesus was probably right <laughs> <laughs> that he said make disciples he gave us our mission strategy and the only real question is is whether we're prepared to follow it and I suspect that when he gave us that strategy, he said, you know, when, when those first disciples heard make disciples, what did they hear? What did they think he was asking them to do? Mm. I think they would have thought he's asking us to have the kind of relationships with other people that he's had with us. Mm -hmm. And the kind of relationship that Jesus had with them seems to me to be quite intimate. He ate with them, he walked with them, he let them watch him do things, he let them practice doing things, he let them out, and then, then when they came back, he said, Yeah, pretty good, or well, you can't do this, or that's how you do this next time, or whatever it might be. It was highly relational, um, it was personal, it was ongoing. And one of the things that we have to escape which whichever culture we're in is the lure of the mass mm. versus the personal mm. um, if a church leader can't disciple personally 50 people but they can create a community in which 50 people are discipled yeah. and you can't begin until you've made some so you have to say i'm going to spend two years working with five people and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I think you can do that in any culture. And when you start working one-on-one -on -one with people or one in, one in five or one in six, their questions, whether pre-Christian culture or a Christendom culture or a post-Christian culture, tend to shape um, what you do. Mm -hmm. So part of it is the moment you're working personally and responding you know, with wisdom to the context in which the people are in, then, then it seems to me you're likely to be fruitful. Mm. And the, the, the one other thing I'd say is that this is also a hermeneutical question. And that is, it's about how we read the Bible and how we teach people to read the Bible. What kind of document is the Bible? And I think, again, whatever culture we're from, one of the things that we have to escape or see afresh, we have to escape the impact of a sacred, secular, divided hermeneutic of the Bible, mm -hmm. a way of reading the Bible that has created the sec or reinforced the sacred, secular, divide. Mm -hmm. And we have to help people read the Bible with whole life eyes. Mm -hmm. So as, as pretty much everybody on this call knows, the Bible is full of material and work. And yet, on the whole, people have not been taught a basic biblical understanding of work. Why is that? Because whenever you come to a passage or a situation which might be about work or is even directly about work, people won't spend very long on it because they don't think it's very important. Mm -hmm. So so there's a hermeneutical issue. Or well, similarly, when you come to, say, take, take David's Psalms, it was a long time before I saw something really obvious about David's Psalms. He, he writes 73 of them. And 81% of those psalms uh, have enemies in them. Sometimes they're called foes. Sometimes they're called people who rise up against me. Mm -hmm. So 81% of them are actually a response to his day job. <laughs> Shields are not, you know, not just metaphors for David. He knows what one looks like. Yeah. When he says, you know, the Lord has strengthened my hands for war and my fingers for battle, 
he actually means for war and battle. Mm -hmm. God has helped him to do his day job. Now, it is extraordinary how little is actually written about David, the author here. Mm -hmm. Even when the psalm says, when the Philistines you know, captured him in Gat in 56, or when, when, he, when he had to leave Jerusalem because of Absalom, Psalm 3, or whatever it might be. So the hermeneutic is really important. These, almost all these documents are grounded in real situations. Mm -hmm. And so for me, one of the key things is to help people recognize and see the, the, the context, the reality that David, you know, in, in, in British or perhaps even in Western terms, David is not a singer songwriter with a, with a rainbow guitar strap. <laughs> penning songs that go on Christian radio. Right. He's just unbuckled his sword and he's put it down. Mm. Or he's sitting in the cave. Mm. So they've come out of come out of real life. So I suppose I mean, one could go on with this, but I suppose that I think one of the keys going forward, whichever culture we come from, is to recover, if you like, um, the a reading a hermeneutic which actually honors the context of the original text and the likely context um, of the writer when they're, they're producing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, indeed what they're describing. So I think that, you know, the, you know, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. If we teach the Bible well, you know, you're 99% away there. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um... Uh, in a few minutes yet, I'm going to ask you for an example of a, of a church um, that is doing whole life discipleship and, and you know, what that looks like. But let me, um, let me open it up to um, uh, the group and see whether uh, uh, one or two or three have questions, comments, or, or reflections. Um, uh, uh, be good if there are questions. Um, Emmanuel, if you would like to uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Renita. Yes, I'm speaking from Ghana. I have a few questions to ask the doctor with you. Mark? Uh, my, my first question is this. To me, what we speak with our mouth is what we do. Now, when we started studying whole life discipleship, and from what you've been saying so far, I get confused in my mind. The more we use the word church to mean the church gathered. You see, when we say the church scattered, and then when you want to refer to your ministry, you say, but Iman church. So what we have done over the years is that the word church means the building where people go together. The word church means uh, ministry. So if, for instance, somebody says um, church of this, church of this, church of this, meanwhile, the person is a church. One or two gathered in Jesus' name is a church. It's not a place. So I want to ask, isn't there any other word we can use for what we call church today mm. so that we will define the church to be the individual? It's a church. In Ghana, we have done something, I want to make it an example, called uh, denomination. Now, what, what they did was that our currency was so bad, so they removed three zeros from our currencies. What we call today 1,000 Ghana cities is actually 10 million old Ghana cities. Now, when they did that, it was difficult for people to accept it, but after eight years or so. Now everybody knows that one city is one city. Meanwhile, one city was before 1,000 cities. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that the church needs to be restored just as, so when I say the church, in my mind, I mean believers. Mm -hmm. In my mind, when I say the church, I don't mean my ministry. And so when we pastors are saying that, and I do that most of the places that I go, this is not a church. The four words is not a church. You are the church. When we scatter, we are the church scattered. And then in a different place, I say in my church, we do this. Then I am confused. So, I mean, I just want us to decipher that. 
So I want to ask you, do you understand what I'm saying? And if it is, if you understand me, what would be the proper way to be used for the church garden instead of saying my church? Because it's not a church. <laughs> thank you, Apostle Emmanuel. Thank you so much. Um, Mark. What a well, first of all, I confess, I repent. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Um, having spent 30 years complaining when people talk about the minister or going into the ministry and telling people what you know john stott used to do this people used to come up to him and say i'm thinking of going into the ministry and he would say which one and they would mm -hmm. say pastoral ministry well why didn't you say so mm -hmm. um and um so i've been i've been exploded you're quite right i've been using that word inappropriately and i will seek to repent from now on church gathered and church scattered i think is a beginning i think it's absolutely brilliant you're right I've been reinforcing it so thank you for that um yeah, I, I don't have another word yet. I mean, the reason, for example, why that language to, to your point is so, so, so important. That's why we came up with the word frontline, because yeah. in my culture, you know, work is divisive. Some people have it, some people don't. And particularly when we have lots of retired people, they feel like second class citizens because they're retired or they feel like second class citizens because they're housewives or house husbands or they're unemployed. Not everyone has a workplace, but everybody has a front line. And not everybody likes front line because it has military connotations. And depending on the state of your country, it might not be a very, very uh, good way to go. So yes, as uh, Derek puts, change the language, change the culture. That's exactly right. That's why we came up with that word. Other people talk about everyday faith. One church talks about ambassadors. You know, I mean, there there is some biblical language there. I haven't come up with another word for what you're talking about, but I, I accept it as a challenge. But I would also suggest that if you get there first, <laughs> sure even, if, even if it's a word in one of your languages or Swahili, I'm happy to take it and use it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good. And and that's, you know, even the beginning of church gathered, church scattered, that's that's the beginning. Uh, I love uh, Apostle Emmanuel, you talked about, um, you know, the analogy of the Ghana CD, they eventually accepted it. Um, you know, what is it? And that's, I think, a good challenge for all of us to think through is, is there a language change that could be accepted? Good. Uh, somebody else? Yeah. Go ahead and raise your hand. Um, Otherwise, while we were waiting for that, um, what, could you tell us a story, um, uh, a, a, an example of a church um, that that has implemented whole life discipleship and, and what that looks like or, or what some of the impacts that you've seen? Yeah, I can. I, can. I, I, I think I'm going to tell you about a church that we didn't work with directly uh, so that it doesn't sound like a bit of propaganda. I can tell you about some we have, but this is a church that I've come to know. Mm -hmm um mod moderately well um and it happens to be a baptist church I, I can give you an anglican one if you prefer um and um it's it's got about two or three hundred people in it and there was a i suppose the story is there was a there was a man there who was a lay person particularly keen on what we would now call whole life discipleship and living it out in in the world and he would he was quite influential in the church and bit by bit he persuaded or maybe the Lord persuaded the, um, the, the man in pastoral charge. Um, the, the senior minister that this was this was a good thing and so they began to do that and um, this man mentored people, if you like, or he discipled individuals. Um, for their workplaces, and so he was growing a group of people mm -hmm. and that group of people then became part of small groups in the church, as you would expect. And then they took it there. And meanwhile, um, the pastor in charge, you know, th the way that they would do their worship services slightly changed. And they would do things like, for example, once every three months, they would have a commissioning service mm -hmm. for anybody who either got a new job or was going to a new school or was going to college or had come back from college or had retired. In other words, 
commissioning people into the new phases of life, whatever they might be. And um, people came forward and they got commissioned. So there was something embedded in the rhythm of the church that enabled this. And his preaching changed because his preaching, because he, he was interested, curious about people. It's one of the things that really interested in me about him was met him. He seemed to know a lot about what his people were doing. Mm. Ask them questions, um, you know, was rich with examples of, of, of that. And then he, the most recent thing, which I think is actually maybe one of the, the, the most significant things that they've done, and they've done a lot of things uh, really, is that he encouraged um, everybody to have what he called a spiritual friend. Mm. And what he noticed was that small groups are good, but they tend um, in, in, in our culture, not necessary to be places where people go very deep in terms of what's going on in their lives. They may do, but often they, they, they might not. Mm -hmm. And so he, he produced a very small little booklet with some questions that you ask each other. And he does it himself. He he does it himself. He 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 meets with a lay person, and he meets him twice a month, one hour for breakfast, and then mm -hmm. he goes. They go for what British people call a drink, mm -hmm. uh, which might not be appropriate in some cultures. In other words, they go to the pub, whether he has lemonade or milk or <laughs> neat vodka, I don't know. <laughs> um, and they because it's a different kind of environment. So in that different environment. And then one day he asked the church, how many of you are doing this? And he found that 75% of the church had been doing it. Mm. And so what that had created over time is he's got almost in every aspect of church life, there is something that is intentionally and purposefully whole life. It's mm. there in the preaching. It's there in the, if you like, the liturgical year. Mm -hmm. um, it's there in what they celebrate. Mm. It's there in the, the mentoring. It's in the small groups. And interestingly, um, when we ask them to um, uh, come and teach other people how to disciple, make disciples through small groups, the person they sent was a lay person mm. who was about 40 years old. And one of the now was one of the disciples of that original guy. Wow. And they sent him to teach church leaders. Mm, mm. That's great. So, I mean, I mean, there's lots one one could say, but um, yeah. probably disciples making disciples, making disciples, making disciples, <laughs> and but highly relational. Yeah, yeah, it's highly relational. Good. Well, Mark, we want to respect your time and the time of everyone else. Um, I am seeing some questions now popping up, but I, I don't know that we have uh, time to address them. Um, uh, you know, the challenge between the terms workplace discipleship, marketplace discipleship, a whole life discipleship. I think those are some things that we do have to um, continue to think through our language. Frontline, again, is much broader. Um, and uh, and inclusive and so we have to think through that when we think of our churches and and so on but uh we want to thank you so much uh, for your time and your willingness to spend this time with us um uh, i know there was a great deal that we can glean from this and uh, continue to think through and process and and we appreciate um uh, that and uh, you're getting some links also uh in the chat that you can oh, thank uh, you follow up on and, and that's good. Uh, go to LICC to see some of the resources that they have. Uh, they're not only intentional with writing resources like Bible studies, all sorts of Bible studies and, and discipleship uh, for whole life uh, things, but also songs um, and encouraging um, uh, the so much of our liturgies to, to be focused on, on all of life. So uh, Mark, we appreciate you. And I'm wondering whether you'd be willing to, to close us in prayer. Um, I'm praying for those who are on this call, uh, your heart's desire for the church uh, to, to come before God with that uh, as we as we leave our time together. May I ask you to, to pray for us? Oh, that would be uh, that would be an honor. 
Yeah, mm. thank you. Father, what a what a, a, a curiously glorious sight um, um, is this screen, uh, just in itself, with all these uh, faces uh, from different uh, parts of the world, all followers of you, Lord. Just a little smidgen of what we long for and what we will one day see in all its glory. People from every tribe and nation um, bowing down and praising the name of. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time. Thank you for our fellowship in you, our yearning to hear your voice, to walk closely with you in the situations you've put us in at this time. I pray your rich, rich blessing on each one here and the work and the teams and the communities and the church gathered and church scattered that they represent. May you grant them your wisdom, Lord. May you grant them their, your hope. May you empower them by word and spirit to choose well, to encourage with courage and gentleness and discernment to be bold in following your lead. We ask Lord for those on the calls who may be struggling um, in whatever way, um, that indeed they would know your love and presence uh, with them this day. And for those people, Lord, that we know who are also engaged in this cause, who uh, at this time find themselves in conflict zones or in areas where there is not just the rumour of war, but war, we ask your blessing on them too. We pray, Lord, that we might continue to encourage one another in this cause, the liberation of all your people for the shalom of the nations, the cities, the towns, the villages that you've called us to be bearers of light, bringers of blessing and of your gospel. Mm. Thank you for this uh, fellowship, Lord, and for Renita leading us this day. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Shalom, mm. who poured out his blood, that we might know his Shalom, and be bearers of it to others. Jesus, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you so thank much. You. Mark, Amen. we appreciate you. Amen. Chris, thank you for uh, helping to organize this. And um, Amen. We, uh, we want to invite you all back again. August 11, we will have our next um uh, discussion as to the cultural barriers uh, from so many places in the world to the integration of, of faith and work in the church. So we pray that you can join us again. Mark, blessings on your day and uh, God bless you all. And um, until next time. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.